All right, guys, welcome to the Hunter's Quest podcast. This is your host, Hunter McWaters, and today I'm joined by my first Kiwi guest, Joe Edlington. Did I say that right? You did, man. You did. Yeah. Nice. Most people probably know me as J.E. Wilds. That's right. Yeah, J.E. Wilds, if you follow him on Instagram or YouTube, which um, he has quite a following, and uh, that's how I found you, was on YouTube. Um, so yeah, man, thanks for joining me today. How you doing? I'm going great, man. I'm going great. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite. So yeah, yeah we've been yeah. talking a little while, man. It's about time we actually finally <laughs> linked this up and made it happen. I know. Well, you're a busy man, and I mean, there's so much opportunity um, for hunting and fishing where you're at. It's like, and you're just all over the place, man. Like you're a machine. So you just been. You just got back from catching some fish. I understand, right? Yesterday, yeah. I I just got back from a a four day fishing trip. Um, we hiked in a long ways into a super remote area and stayed That's there for cool. four days. And yeah, we're targeting we're targeting big fish on you know things like this, just big, big surface lures. Yeah, big that stick, is giant. Big, big poppers. Um, and the the fish we're catching are big fish, and they they can they definitely put you to the test. A couple times we nearly got pulled in because. I, I know, know, dude. I probably won't go into too much detail, but if you you have to run heavy gear. And you have to run a really heavy drag, otherwise you just they just win every fight. So you're the weak link. And yeah. a couple of times we were very close to being pulled in. But we caught I think we landed fourteen big fish, you know, like talking real nice fish. So it was it was a great trip. Literally just got back yesterday, man. So I'm unpacking, yeah. I've got stuff lying around everywhere. And um yeah, it's just good to relax for a little bit to be honest. <laughs> uh for sure, man. Okay, so I, I like fishing. It's not really my like thing, but I do like fishing. I think usually, I think the reason I don't like fishing that much is because I'm not very good at it, and so usually I don't catch anything. But when you're actually catching fish, it is awesome. And you sent me a short that you made on YouTube. You guys gotta go check it out. Um, it, I mean, this looks like fishing I'd be in for. Like, and the fact that you guys hiked in—that's super cool. I've never heard of like backcountry like hike in fishing, so that's already got my attention. And yeah, literally I'm watching this thing and you're like jumping around the rocks, like, ugh, like almost getting pulled in by this fish. So that looks pretty epic, man. Yeah, it is. It's exciting. It's like, it's nuts. You got to experience it one day, man. But it's, it's, it's not like heading down to your local pier or jetty and <laughs> dropping a bait over the side and winding up a little fish. This is like, yeah, it's wild, bro. <laughs> yeah. I'd be in for that, man. So did you guys pack out like fish meat? No. So all the fish, all the big fish that we were targeting, like the main target species, um, it's it's called a kingfish too, if anyone's wondering. So a yellowtail kingfish. You actually get them in the States, um, down in Florida and places like that. You mm -hmm. get them, but they're generally smaller. Over here in New Zealand, we've got the largest, uh, we've got the largest type of them and they can, they get big and they're super aggressive. Um, so the main, the main goal was to catch a whole lot of these fish and film a few episodes for my fishing channel. I've got a hunting channel and a fishing channel and I sort of summertime I do the fishing winter time and through the ruts I do the hunting but um, the goal was to catch these fish film a few episodes for for my audience out there and let them go and and just nice. have, have a great time doing it so um, we're ta tagging them for research purposes That's and cool. um, and then in amongst that we're catching you know different size fish that we take back to camp and and eat but yeah it's basically okay. like a, a it's like a back country hunt yeah but we're going there to go fishing you know we've got we've got <laughs> 30 kilo packs what's that 70 60 70 pound yeah. packs on our backs all our tents all our cooking gear all the gear that you would take if you went out hunting but we're going fishing <laughs> that's legit man i've never heard of that that's and i like that that's awesome yeah it's good um, fun man it's real good fun yeah that sounds like it so what the the coolest fishing story I have is, like I said, I, we were talking on text. I grew up in the Chesapeake Bay. So about 80 miles off the coast here is a thing called the Norfolk Canyon. And it's basically where the shelf, the continental shelf just drops off. And there's really good fishing out there. And me and my friend in high school, we took like a 18-foot center console off. And it was like two and a half miles. I mean, two and a half hours just like full out to get out there. And I'm sure you've been on the open ocean, like, I think it's six miles you can only see uh, onto the horizon before, like, the curvature of the earth, that's as far as you can see. And when you're that far out, 
when you're trying to go back, if you're only like a few degrees off your course, you'll just drive forever and never see land until you run out of fuel and like you're just screwed, right? You're so, up in Australia or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, or dead, um, like cutting your friend's leg off and eating it. Um, but anyway, so we got out there. I actually hooked a white marlin, and of course we're like high school idiots. And I'm like, you know, this thing's on there, and it's like breaching out of the water. And I'm like, something don't feel right. And I look down, and the reel on my buddy's rod is just like rattling around, like about to fall off. So I'm like uh, trying to screw it back on. We lose the fish. But the worst part was not long after that, all the electronics on our boat just turn off. Like, yeah, charts compass radio like everything we didn't have any backup radios no cell phone service and so literally for like probably 20 30 minutes like i thought we were like in big trouble like we might die you couldn't see the land yeah oh no we were like 70 80 miles offshore and oh my um gosh. Yeah. yeah and uh anyway we were able to i was able to like jiggle the battery around and got the thing to turn on for a second and found our heading on the compass like the water compass and yeah. and was able to find our heading and, and make it back but it was super scary so after that i was like i'm done with doing offshore by myself <laughs> yeah man that's a that's definitely a scary situation to be in for sure <laughs> yeah um but anyway man yeah. um enough about me i definitely want to hear like some about your adventures and stuff um, including I, like I said, I found you just on, um, on YouTube. And to be honest, I hadn't, you know, usually on Saturday mornings, I kind of hit the old YouTube and try to just see what's out there. Cause I'm, you know, sort of in the, like I said, I have the TV show, but I'm also trying to build up my YouTube and stuff like that. And, um, and I saw some of your videos and I'm like, who is this dude? And there's like, you know, half a million views, 750,000 views. I think you have like you probably have, do you have any like with a million yet? Yeah, I've got there's quite a few in the yeah. millions. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're, my highest viewed video is five point something mil on the Yeah, channel. insane. So you're basically crushing it. I was like, who is this guy? And so I hit it and then I saw you doing stuff with Pedro, who's kind of a buddy of mine. So I was like, All right, I gotta talk to this guy. So yeah, man. Um thanks for joining me. And I know you just recently started a podcast too. How how's that going? Oh, it's good. Yeah, yeah. I um oh man, it's just everyone's always asking you know they want more content they want more stuff and so many people hit me up about doing a podcast and i was just i was sort of thinking you know uh, it'd be cool to do so we just started doing it and it's pretty casual uh, most of most of what i talk about is, um basically recapping a hunt like we might have just done a 10-day hunt and then as we're sitting in the in the tent or as we're back at the motel you yeah. know we, we recap what we've just done Mm -hmm. I haven't, I, I'm, I'm not really planning to interview people or anything, but it's all, the podcast is only about what the experience we've just done, you know, the hunts, the fishing trips, things like that. So, nice. man, I haven't, I think there's only 10, 10 or so episodes up there at the moment. There's a heap more that I've got to, you know, start dropping out. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool, man. And the feedback's been amazing. Like dudes are loving it. So yeah, it's yeah. just, just another way that I can sort of get content out there and get people frothing on the outdoors, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I think those recap podcasts do pretty well, and you can really kind of go into way more detail than like you can in your videos, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, the first ones, the first ones I did, I was actually it was the start of this year in our raw, which is our our rut period mm -hmm. for the red deer, and um, I was solo, and it was a it was an eight day hunt in a super remote wilderness zone, and um, I think halfway or three or four days into the trip, in my tent. I was I recorded the first part of the podcast, so I just basically up until that point, I just recap what had happened, like created a really cool storyline, and then um, and then you know three days later I recorded the next piece in the tent. So the I think the first four episodes on my podcast channel are all about that particular hunt. Nice. And um, yeah, like you say, it breaks it down it way more detail than you'll ever see in the videos, <laughs> and um, it's like behind the scenes kind of vibe. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, it's something to just accompany the YouTube, the YouTube series. And I mean, that, that hunt there in particular, while we're talking about it, I got two YouTube episodes out of it mm -hmm. and, um, it was great. Both the episodes did really well. They're both in the middle, uh, in between one and 2 million views, I think on, on both those episodes they are doing really well. Wow. And, um, the podcast, like 
guys are just, you know, sending me messages and stuff saying that they're absolutely loving hearing the behind the scenes to that hunt. Yeah. You know, they can watch the hunt and then they can listen to the podcast or or vice versa, you know, whichever order. And they can hear more detail because it was a freaking cool hunt, man. So why not create as much content as possible around that, yeah, for you know, sure. that particular adventure? They have something so, to do when you're sitting in your tent yeah, alone. Cool. <laughs> I was saying it's something, to do, it's something to do when you're sitting in your tent alone too <laughs> exactly man exactly I'm normally I'm just like eating all my food and I've got to try and like hold back a bit but you know it gives me something to do for an hour or two you know so yeah it's good it's real good no it's cool man yeah it's it's really cool to watch your videos because um like it's just especially like the terrain like one of the ones I watched like you're in this like just freaking rainforest looking like jungle with like ferns everywhere and then like these huge stags come out and i'm like that's awesome man so um so yeah I, I was gonna maybe talk about this a little later but we're kind of on the topic so um i don't know like oh i was gonna ask you your demographics like where are most of those people watching from is it a lot of u.s guys australia new zealand are a good combination like what's where's most of your uh audience most of my audience is the u.s okay and like then um, by a Australia, lot, or... New Zealand, yeah, US is is huge, man. Yeah. And do you think huge. that's kind of what plays into it? Is um, people kind of like the uniqueness of it? Is that part of it? You think? Like, what do you what do you think are some of the ingredients for your success? Because I mean, there's tons of guys out there making YouTube films, and like, but you're crushing it, man. Yeah, I think uh, there's there's probably there's probably many different points. Mm -hmm. Um that that go into making a good video in my opinion it's definitely how you film it and how you edit it um and then it's also the content around it but yeah oh, how do i explain it so or, or since i've been doing this i've always thought there's two different styles you know if i if i roughly break it down there's two different styles of films you can make um the first style being like a a, a high production quality video you know mm -hmm. it's like a like a movie you know it's got a lot more energy and effort gone into creating it so we'll call that the cinematic style and then the second style is the vlog style which is rough it's raw and it's real and um so what i've learned over the years is although me personally i've got a creative edge and i really want to be doing the cinematic films you know nicely done um all fancy like <laughs> but they don't do good on youtube man they don't yes, do good at all so that's so true um the vlog the vlog style you know the second the second option people love watching that stuff man people love the personalized feel they don't want to see all the fancy things and the fancy camera angles and stuff they do but they don't they don't get involved into it they don't get emotionally invested in it as much hmm. so i i try to keep all my all my stuff in the vlog category um, I obviously try to capture some some nice um, scenes, you know, some nice visuals to go with it. But I keep the edit within a, a particular template that I that I've come up with that is going to fit that vlog approach. And hmm. um, and yeah, just high engagement, man. That's what you want. You want the people to be. F um, when I first started, I started calling calling the, these episodes like a virtual hunt. So you at home. You're sitting there on your sofa, on your couch, wherever. Um, you're coming with me on a virtual hunt. I'm your hunting guide. You're standing right next to me and let's go. Let's do it. That's how I started the approach early on. I was mm. like talking about a virtual hunt, you know, come with me on this hunt. And um, and I, I quickly realized that, yeah, people, if you can, if you can stick to a certain template, um, high engagement driven, people really feel invested in it. And they feel like they're right there with you. Like you go through my YouTube comments, man. Um, my DMs, my private messages, people saying, I felt like I was right there with you. And that's the idea. You want people to be there. You don't want them to be separated from what you're doing. Um, and that's that's kind of what I do personally. So there's many, when I'm editing the videos, there's all sorts of cool content that I could put in there from a cool creative, visual, you know, nicely filmed perspective. But I disregard it because I know it's going to hurt how it works That's on YouTube. So interesting, man. Yeah. <clears throat> so what what you see on YouTube is basically the rawest form of what we've done. You know, we might have filmed some incredible stuff, man. Um, but 
I don't put it in the videos because it's going to ultimately <laughs> harm how the video goes. And that's pretty bad. That's that's pretty hard to do, to be honest, man. When you're sitting there and you've got uh, yeah. some incredible footage and you're, you're thinking, man, this is, this is epic footage, but I'm not going to use it, you know? It's like... <laughs> It's such a weird thing but that's just it's what works for me man and that's just how it's how it's that's wild man yeah how I, I, how I do it anyway you know that's something that i've been like thinking more and more about and kind of like just started realizing but you just like really like encapsulated it man i guess like i guess people want to th- it's more relatable i guess like people want to feel like oh i could do that you know yeah you it's, look at you look at the biggest viral videos out there. I could, I'd probably imagine a high percentage of them in the 90% would be someone recording something on their phone, posting it raw, you know? Mm-hmm. So if, if videos like that go viral, people just fully invested in it, you know? But if you did the same thing with 10 different cameras, gimbals, <laughs> drones, all this, you know, all the stuff, um if you did this tried to recreate the same clip there's probably a high chance it's not going to go viral so yeah for me i try to keep my episodes as 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 vlog approach as possible and then the people really get to know me personally because you know it's it's raw it's it's like i'm filming it on my phone yeah. is what i'm trying to get at and and once the people um you know once the audience really gets to know you as a presenter um, and feel like they know you really well because you're showing them stuff that you wouldn't normally if you were doing a high production type budget film. Um, that's when you get people really enjoying your content because they know who you are. Like when people see me, they know me. They know who, what I'm like. They know what I do. So they know what to expect. They know it's going to be a cool experience of a video. So that's, yeah, in a nutshell, that's kind of how I operate. But That's cool, yeah. man. I started, yeah, it's... I started my YouTube channel in 2010. Mm-hmm. And um, way back then, so I used to... I used to do a lot of hunting, probably 15 years of hunting with dogs. Um, I had two teams of hunting dogs and, and we'd chase wild boar and things like that. So nice. I used to film a lot of those those episodes back in those days. And they did really well back then. And that was like when YouTube was pretty early on um, and they got really good traction. So that, that was like an, uh, a hobby for me, an amateur thing. I'd go for a hunt anyway and I'd just carry a video camera and film it. And people were like all over it. And then, um, yeah, sort of time went by, um, and I, um, when I was a kid, I had two dreams. I wanted to be a hunting guide, or I wanted to be a farmer. <laughs> and by a farmer, I mean like a, <laughs> Dude, that's you know, so on, a ho- on horseback with a team of dogs in the mountains, herding animals through the mountains, that type okay. of farmer. Um, and anyway, I ended up becoming a hunting guide. So guiding was awesome. Um, we had a lot of clients. Most of the clients were um, from America. Um, you know, you guys coming over and hunting over here. I um, I worked with Gerald Fluidy, who's like a father to me. Is he uh, really related to Joe Fluidy? He's Joe's dad. Yep. Figured. So yeah, really, really close with that family. Um, they're really close, and and Gerald owns a guiding business called an outfitting business called Wildside Hunting Safaris. So I I used to work work for Gerald I started as a guide and then we became really good friends and and then basically family now and um and the guiding was awesome that was a dream of mine that took up a huge amount of, of time obviously so the the hunting with the dogs took a backward step and mm-hmm. then that sort of disappeared into the past um but you know COVID hit <laughs> and closed down our tourism industry instantly yeah. overnight basically as you guys are fully aware of so mm-hmm. all of a sudden i'm thinking what am i going to do you know i'm not a builder i'm not a plumber i'm not an electrician what am i going to do i know yeah. how to film things i know how to photograph hunts um because with the guiding you know i'm running cameras i'm photographing hunts and doing all that stuff filming hunts as well as guiding um and then i was like well man this is like the first time in 10 years i've had the I've had the time where I can go on my hunts for, you know, just me. Yeah. And I can hunt, the, I can hunt the rut. You know, I've never, I've never been able to hunt the rut for, for all those years because we're guiding clients and getting them onto animals. But all of a sudden I'm able to hunt the rut for myself. And I'm like, man, this is kind of exciting. So, <laughs> so that's, so anyway, I thought, well, maybe I should start firing up the YouTube channel again. And, and I had, I've got a few close friends who are also full-time YouTubers and, b- and back then they were full-time YouTubers already, you know, 
and they were always telling me man joe you need to go and you need to just get youtube crank and get into it just and so they're always in my ear talking about it and now was the perfect opportunity because i don't there's no tourism industry so there's no guiding and all of a sudden i'm basically jobless you know mm -hmm. i've got certain skills but i've got no job officially so i was like well now's as good a chance to do it as any time so yeah i just i took i took the jump and in 2020 i filmed i think six i think it was six episodes or something for my youtube channel and um and it's basically snowballed from there man it's just started from there and, and it's cranking and and in the guiding industry we make friends with a lot of um, brands and hunting partners you know things like that so when a lot of the brands heard that i was doing this there was some pretty decent interest in them getting behind me and sponsoring the show and things like that so mm -hmm. one thing led to another and it's now 2023 saying i've been doing it full time ever since man and i would never look back it's yeah. just every year it gets bigger and bigger and um it's yeah that's awesome it's man. just a crazy ride bro it's real it's a weird thing but i'm loving every day of it man to be honest yeah so, i can i can imagine um yeah so many things about you kind of remind me of myself like uh the dog hunting so dog hunting is huge here in virginia where i grew up hunting um uh, we we hunt deer with dogs um okay. i don't do it so much anymore but um i used to always want to be a farmer and i was a kid too and then you know, I don't think, uh, <laughs> unfortunately my uh, rise hasn't been as meteoric as yours, but I kind of launched during COVID as well. Um, so that's cool stuff, man. Um, so t yeah, t tell me a bit about yourself. Like, yeah. I, yeah, you've got a TV show over there. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for asking. Not many people ask, uh, questions back to me during podcasts, <laughs> but, um, yeah. And going back to what you were saying earlier, man, like it's, it's it's hard for me because I I have a background in professional television. I worked for a national TV show, nothing to do with hunting, for like seven years as a cameraman. Then I was a producer, and so like I'm like trained in you know cinematic production, you know making it look just clean and sharp, and you know what I mean. So it's like um, sometimes these videos I'll put out, I'm like, man, they're so good, but like no one's watching. Like what's going on? And like. Um, I'm start. It's starting to click, kind of what you're saying, and it's just hard for me to not that it's um one way is better than the other. It's just it's just hard for me to like do it in a different way than like what I'm used to. But um yeah, yeah man, for me, like I I grew up hunting since I was you know eight years old. My dad got me out bird hunting and duck hunting here in the Chesapeake Bay, and then around 14, um I got permission to bow hunt on this farm on the eastern shore of virginia which is this tiny little strip of land between the ocean and the chesapeake bay and um there's just tons of deer like there's no natural predators and there's just tons of deer and so um i started bow hunting and you know i always loved hunting but like that first night watching the deer come in that field like i was hooked on big game like it was that was it so for me, I didn't really like party much in high school or like, you know, I played sports, but for me, like weekends, I was driving over, I was hunting the whole weekend by myself, deer hunting. And, um, yeah. And then, you know, life took some weird turns and I started working in TV and did a few different things. Um, and then I got invited, um, I guess it was 2020. It was right in the middle of COVID to, um, to Alaska by a friend um, to do like a DIY walk in caribou hunt, just like public land. Like we didn't fly in or anything. It was just like rent a U-Haul truck, drive up, walk in, try to kill some caribou. And, uh, we never killed anything, man. But, um, going from my hunting culture, which not knocking it, but it was private land. It was park your truck, walk 500 yards, sit in a tree stand, wait for a deer to walk by kind of thing. Um, yep. mainly. And so going from that to now we're hiking, we're camping, we're backpacking, you know, um, in the mountains, you know, you got the physical fitness aspect of it, which is a whole nother part of my journey, which hunting played a huge role in, um, that, you know, mental and this, even the spiritual like challenge, um, I was all in, I was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Um, so after that trip, even though we didn't even fill tags, um, I came home and 
you know, I'm um, also a pretty spiritual guy. So I felt like God was telling me, Hey, like start a podcast. You can kind of have a, I feel like I could have a unique voice in there as a East coast guy, which you, you, I don't know how familiar you are with the U S but over here, kind of the Southeast is more like whitetail hunting, more like agricultural, um, for the most part. And then out West is where you find like the mule deer and the elk and the more mountain type hunting and stuff. So, um, so anyway, I feel like it kind of had this unique voice of guys like me who were trying to transition and do more mountain hunting. And so I started the podcast and, um, yeah, I got linked up with some, some really awesome guys who were kind of like my heroes at the time. And, um, and they, you know, got a shot with, uh, Dan Staten. I filmed the elk hunt for him with elk shape and then did some stuff with Brian call with gritty and, um, and started putting out some YouTube stuff. And then, um, and then the TV show thing kind of happened where I had a connection to do it. I thought it might be a good idea to try. So, and with my experience, so I just, the show is actually just finishing now the first season. I got the second season about 80% filmed and in the can. Um, but I'm trying to, through some creative stuff, like I'm trying to do the TV and do digital, which is hard to do and for certain reasons, but I'm trying to kind of get around those reasons, uh, without going into much detail, but I'm trying to do digital and TV and do them both well and keep the podcast going, which has been going for like three years. So, um, so yeah, man, uh, that's where I'm at. Um, trying to figure it all out, you know. For me, it's it's been more of kind of a um, steady growth, but slower kind of methodical grinding it out growth. And um, but I love it, you know. Just just like any your job, there's parts that are annoying and stressful and whatever. But um, I absolutely love it, and I love the industry. And uh, hopefully, I'll be able to do it for the rest of my career, <laughs> as long as I can uh, yeah. find the people to back me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yeah, 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 no, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. The um, what's I got a question for that? Like, what's the uh, in New Zealand? Our t- our public television network, like our TV stuff, is like it's definitely on a downward trend by quite a quite a long ways. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, h- hence why I I sort of just went all in on digital because instantly yeah. I can we reach I can reach international audience. But um, yeah, like in in America, you guys have you guys have dedicated channels, outdoors channels and things like yeah. that, don't you? So there's, there's always going to be a decent following over there, isn't there for the outdoor content? Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, I think that for sure the way the world is going is going digital. Absolutely. Um, you know, YouTube is, and a lot of these companies are heading that direction too. Um, so, in a general sense, you are right. And I think that things are going largely digital. Like people are pulling the plug, getting rid of cable and stuff like that. But yeah, we do over here. There's two kind of big ones. There's outdoor channel and sportsman channel. So my show is on sportsman channel. And, um, yeah, I mean that, and that's why I'm trying to have a kind of attack both, um, and do them well, which like I said, is not easy. And, in some ways I almost saw the TV thing as um, like I felt like a, some of the reason why people weren't doing it was because of the barriers to entry, the kind of the technical knowledge you need to have the, the additional work. Cause it's a lot more work to put a TV episode on the air than it is to put a YouTube video on. Um, but I felt like I had the skills to be able to pull it off and to be honest, I was thinking, you know, if I, you know, maybe, you know, when YouTube started, like you were saying, you got really good traction um, right away when, you know, probably wasn't as many creators on YouTube as there is now. Um, I'm not knocking your work by any means. Um, I'm just just saying how it is. And so kind of when I entered the space, I felt like it was a lot more saturated and I would already had been putting some stuff out on YouTube and it wasn't really getting much traction. And for other reasons, you know, just like the whole kind of fear of maybe big tech eventually shutting hunting down or something. I was like, let's yeah. give TV a couple years. Um, and if nothing else, maybe it will kind of get my name recognition up, get the brand recognition up. 
and kind of drive more traffic back to my digital channels. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where my head was at with that. And I talked to some other guys here that I respect that are still doing TV and doing well. And I think, um, you know, I think there always will be outdoor TV, you know. Um, I think a lot of the exciting new cool stuff like like what you got going is digital and that's where a lot of the younger folks are but i do think there's always going to be a place for tv and it's outdoor tv is still perform performs pretty well but um yeah that's how i'm just trying to find the balance of it all man yeah i i think it sounds like a pretty good move going tv first you know tv as well as your digital yeah because you're right you got a tv show instantly you've you've got a bit of name recognition there and that's going to help for the future big time yeah, I mean, I felt like, you know, if I could go to a company and say, hey, I can, I have this to offer and I can offer you a 15 or a 30 second slot on TV. It's going to run four times a week on a Sportsman channel. Like that's already kind of like a built in something I can sell. Um, whereas I come like, hey, my content's really great. I only have 6,000 subscribers, but it's still really good. You know what I mean? Like it's not, they're like, okay, I don't care. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, so. yeah, there's that many that many people trying to do it, like you say. So brands yeah. get peppered; they get oh, peppered know, by, by people trying to um, <laughs> trying to sponsor up with them. But I know, then yeah, it's just a thing. You just got to create content and just um and just make a name for yourself that way. And and then the brands, you know, the brands they'll notice you in that in that regard. But um, I think the TV thing's a cool idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm gonna see how it goes. You know, I'm gonna um, give it at least another two seasons um and see see where i'm at then but um that's kind of where i'm at right now so but uh yeah i feel like almost like you've been uh, interviewing me on this podcast man <laughs> which well, is fine <laughs> no it should be it should be both ways you know like dude sure i agree people out there that have, there's people out, out there that have listened to your podcast for three years but there's probably a lot of stuff that they don't know about you or they'd want to hear about you if that makes sense so for sure man why not? <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that, dude. I really do. Plus, I'm learning, man. This is the first time we've ex had a proper chat, apart from you know what's happened, all that sort of stuff. So, absolutely, you know, I'm I'm learning myself. Yeah, I love it, dude. Um, I, I I wish I feel like a lot of times people when they get asked to be on a podcast, they kind of drop into okay, I'm being interviewed. Whereas, and and when I started the podcast, I was coming from TV interviewing people, which is very scripted, yeah. very you're like crafting questions to get desired answers. Whereas podcasts are very different, they should be back and forth conversations. So I appreciate it, man. Yeah, oh, I hope hopefully the audience are getting some gems out of it. That's that's the whole goal, man. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully we're not revealing too much uh, behind the curtain stuff here. Um, I wanted to dig in more about like I want you to coach me some more on YouTube, but I don't want to feel like you're giving away all your secrets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that's a chat for offline. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, uh, I I do work. I actually do work with a few channels, helping helping them grow and helping them. Okay, you know all the tricks that I've learned over the years. I, I sort of I sort of mentor a few channels. So yeah, yeah, that's 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 quite fun, man. Just seeing seeing sort of an increase in growth from from all the guys. So. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot I could learn from you, dude. There definitely is a there definitely is a few top secret tip to tricks and tips that I'm you know, I keep pretty close. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet. Um well, that's cool, man. Well, um I am a little bit interested. We could talk about that stuff all the time, probably for a long time, but yeah. Um I am a little bit interested in and I don't know, this might be boring for you, I don't know, but um just people who might listen to the podcast. Like when I got into Western hunting, I'd never heard like, what you can hunt in New Zealand. Like, are you, like I had, I was like New Zealand, like, okay, Lord of the Rings. That's pretty much all I knew. And then like yeah. I got into Western hunting and I'm like, wow, this is like a freaking land of opportunity, man. So like it instantly became like one of my dreams to hunt over there. Um, yeah. I'm sure being a guide and going up there, you know, a little bit about like kind of the history of hunting in New Zealand and sorry if it's boring, but I'd love to, if you, if you could educate my audience a little bit about, you know, um, how and why there's such great hunting opportunity in New Zealand. I'd love to hear that. Yeah. So, um, where do I start? So I guess we've got <laughs> in New Zealand, we have, we've got a, a very varied terrain, you know, there's, um, real quick, if I could give you a place to start, if you don't mind. Like, how did white people end up on New Zealand and then start from there? <laughs> um, 
that's probably a little bit out of my out of my pay grade. Okay. I don't know. I don't know the well. Okay, so the traditional people to New Zealand are the Maori people, okay. and um, they originated from the Polynesian islands. They came mm. over in in what's called a waka, which is a canoe um, carved out of a tree. So. Um, the traditional people on New Zealand are the Māori people. And then European settlers um, obviously discovered New Zealand and they started sort of populating the place. And, and, you know, there was early on, there was battles against the traditional people and and the newcomers. But eventually they came to some sort of agreement and they ended up being able to live together, you know. It was a British colony, correct? That's right, yeah. So... So this is going back. This is this is long before my time, mate. You know, <laughs> I haven't course. been around this long, but <laughs> but so um yeah that that sort of that sort of happened. And then um if we fast forward, if we fast forward, you know, to the early nineteen hundreds, um, New, New Zealand was was known as like this beautiful destination. Uh, mm-hmm. We've got tropical beaches. Well, it's it's not really tropical. It's subtropical. We've got mm. soft corals and things like that, but it's not like the Great Barrier Reef or French Polynesia or somewhere like that, but warm water, clear water, um, white sand, and, you know, subtropical zones. But then we've also got rainforests. We've also got open tussock country, you know, like um, Montana or somewhere like that. We've got um, mountainous peaks. So you can literally drive from the most beautiful tropical looking beach you've ever seen with clear blue water and in the same day, be driving through rainforests and end up in freaking mountainous zones, wow. like Rocky Mountains. That's so awesome. We've we've got a huge variation in landscape here in New Zealand, and what that does is that creates some big excitement around what's on offer here. So you know, there's incredible fishing. We've got incredible country here in in you know terrain and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. New Zealand historically is a land of birds so we don't have mammals the only the only native mammals we have is there's um some small bats and um (laughs) they're the only native mammals that we have in new zealand wow interesting a land of birds bats a couple of mammals which are bats and reptiles so you've got this amazing amazing country but you've got no game animals so early 1900s, people like Teddy Roosevelt and other sort of royal family members, things like that, decided, hey, let's make New Zealand the outdoorsman paradise. Let's make New Zealand <laughs> um, the most, you know, the best destination in the world to, to go and visit and hunt and fish and do all the things in all this varied um, environment. Yeah. So all of a sudden, they're, they're bringing over animals. So um, Teddy Roosevelt... Um, royal family members, all sorts of people were donating and gifting certain types of animals to New Zealand to try and establish breeding populations, which will then establish a game population to create this outdoorsman's paradise, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we've got, we've, we've got, um, we've got elk, we've got white-tailed deer. Yeah, we've which I didn't red... realize. I saw the other day a post. Somebody was like, well, they have white tail over there too? That's crazy. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's 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 crazy what we got. But <laughs> it's even crazier what we were gifted that didn't take as well. So what we do have now, what we're currently yeah, keep going on here. is we've got, we've got elk, we've got white tail, we've got red deer, which is your, you guys know them as stags. Mm-hmm. Um, red deer, um, we've got fallow deer. We've got seeker deer, which you've got, you got, you guys call them sicker deer over there, and they're seeker deer, the Asian right ones that look like tiny elk, kind of. Yep, they come up. They're generally. Yeah. A, we have like a, a we have t- a population of those in Maryland, not far from where that's I live, right. actually. Yeah, that's close that's to where right. I live. Yeah, yeah. When you said Chesapeake Bay, I, that's exactly that's the first thing I thought of. So, <laughs> so we've got those. We've got some. We've got really good, really good genetics on those as well. By the way, like incredible. We've got rooster deer. We've got sambar deer. Um, I've kind of lost my train of thought now that we went off topic, but <laughs> that's okay. I'm pretty sure that's I'm pretty sure that's all the main species. We've got we've got chamois, um, European chamois. Mm-hmm. We've got Himalayan tar. We've got uh, obviously we've got 
goats, you know, feral goats, we call them here. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> many different types, Spanish goats, things like that. We've got wild boar. Um, and all of these things were either gifted to New Zealand to create the outdoorsman's paradise or for, for the wild boar and, and potentially the goats. They were brought over by um, Captain Cook. I don't know if you know who Captain Cook was, um, a great yeah, I remember pioneer of the early days. Him. Yeah, and they just they'd sail around in in their in their boat and they would drop off, <clears throat> excuse me, they drop off wild pigs and they drop off goats on certain areas and then they know next time they come back there's going to be a population of, of food for them. So oh wow, uh, a lot of the places that have wild pigs and wild goats originate from that. But anyway, so we've got we've got wild pigs, we've got wild goats as well, and then um, there's animals that were 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 gifted to us. Um, as well that that didn't survive you know the 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 breeding population that they brought over didn't they didn't live and they didn't last and they didn't populate so we had moose um, oh, cool. there's an area here where we had moose and there's even to this day there's still there's still sightings of people that have seen <laughs> what they think is a moose and there's there's a few sort of biologists that uh sort of devoting their life to to study and just see if there still is moose living because wow. where the moose where the moose are um is the same zone where where the wild elk are okay. and it's about as wild and remote as you can possibly get anywhere in the world so very wow. hard terrain to navigate and there's are they rocky mountain all... elk yeah they are rocky mountain elk okay. yeah so there's all there's all the there's all the possibilities that the moose are still there because the place they live in is ridiculously, it's like, I don't even know how to explain it, but it's like the most remote, wildest place you could ever come across. Dude, if you um, kill a moose, oh, you'll be just next level. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's the thing. We always have this conversation, me and, me and the boys, we always have this conversation, you know, like if we're hunting elk or red deer in those zones and we come across a moose, what do you, do, you do yeah do you shoot it do you or not? shoot it do you film it and it's like if you if you shot it you would you know it, it would be it would go massive as far as all the news the tv they'd be all over it there's a moose you know a hunter got a moose but you'd get huge backlash from it as well backlash because yeah you know you killed the last, the last one moose. yeah <laughs> i have that so conversation with like... my friends about if you saw bigfoot would you shoot it <laughs> yeah fully it's the same thing man it's exactly the same thing so i think for me personally if i was hunting and, and we come across a bull moose or a cow moose or something you know first thing i do would be freak out i'd be like what the heck we've just <laughs> discovered this um i'd probably film it to be honest oh yeah and I'd, get footage I'd probably document it really well and um and and go from there i don't think i i don't i don't think i could have the heart to shoot it to be honest um yeah so the moose the moose thing's quite exciting you know it is. I, That's I quite interesting. like that I quite like that crypt, that real cryptic kind of, kind of yeah. stuff where you, there's potentially they're there, but they're they're not. You know, I like that stuff. Like anyway. I just saw on uh, Instagram, they just found a uh, golden mole that they thought had been extinct for eighty six years in like Africa somewhere. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> crazy. Anyway, sorry. So that's 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 exactly the thing. You just don't know what you just don't yeah, know. Right? You never know. There's so many hiding spots for these things. So the moose, the moose were. They were fairly, they were fairly established, but and I mean they were, I think they were there. I think the last moose that was seen or potentially shot was in the 1960s, hmm. so they were there for a while, you know. Um, I don't quote me on that date, but they were there for a while anyway. And then um, even like two years ago, there was a an apparent sighting out of a helicopter, and the oh. guy, it was a it was a a young hunting guide who was flying in a helicopter potentially with some clients or whatever. And they flew over an area and he saw a moose and um, it made a massive deal over here. Uh, but this guy goes and hunts the cat. He guides in the Canadian seasons for moose. He knows what he's looking at. Oh, he so knows was, what a moose looks a like. Fairly, yeah. It was a fairly hot, hot sighting, but anyway, that's um, cool. So the moose, if they were, if they were here in big numbers, imagine that that's another incredible animal that we could be hunting. Um, yeah. then we, then we had, we had stone sheep that were oh, gifted, wow. um, but they didn't, they didn't take, we had mule deer, but they didn't Whoa. take either. Um, I think there was access deer, which chittle, depending on which part of the world you are, mm -hmm. access chittle, uh, they didn't take either. 
Um, what am I missing? Yeah, there's that. Uh, that might be it, but there's yeah. That's cool, man. There's quite a few species. So we've got what we do have here now. There's seven types of deer. So if I missed one, there's seven types of deer here in New Zealand, and then we've got alpine animals: tar, chamois, and um, yeah, they're in fully fully established populations here in New Zealand. Yeah. So yeah, I feel like part you want to go. I feel like the tar and the chamois and probably the red stag get like most of the publicity and then, but there's, there's so many other cool animals to hunt. And like I said, I, I just found out like recently that they had whitetail and elk, which is pretty cool. And just goes to show that whitetail can like live anywhere, man. Like I live in like a suburban neighborhood and I saw like an eight pointer right behind my house. Like last, last night, my wife shot one in our yard with her bow like a yep. month ago, like, like 30 yards from my swimming pool. <laughs> that, that's but, awesome, um, man. I, I, I'll just quickly say this while we're on topic is I, in my spare time, if I turn on my TV to watch something, it's always YouTube. Yeah. And at the moment in the last, or probably the last couple of years, my go-to thing to watch that I get really excited to watch is whitetail deer hunting. Okay. But, you know, you guys over there doing it. So there's a few channels that I watch and that's a, that's exciting to me, man. I, I love the fact that there's a whole lot of prep going into I, I like the target deer. You know, I like it when someone's got a target buck yeah. and they're prepping all season. They're growing the food plots. They're prepping their, their area. They're doing all that stuff to hopefully get the chance of getting that one buck. Yeah. I love that, man. I freaking yeah. love that. So, yeah, that's that's exciting for me to watch, man. I love yeah. that sort of stuff. Hey? Yeah, for me, it's like different, that's... It's completely different to what I do, obviously. It's right. not the, the backpack wilderness mountain hunts. It's, you know, it's, it's yeah. suburban or it's, you know, like you say, it's sort of, it's on the farms or something, but yeah, I find well, myself just getting really into it. It's yeah. It's just like, it's kind of like the reason I really fell in love with Western hunting is just cause it was, it was almost like starting hunting all over again. You know what I mean? Like I had to learn so yeah. much new stuff and it's still, and so that's, you know, that's what it is. And I see a lot of guys in America, like, uh, that, you know, grew up in Idaho and Montana and stuff, and they're starting to get into whitetail hunting because it's just like a new thing. It's like, uh, starting to learn to hunt all over again. And I got to say, uh, as a guy who grew up whitetail hunting and now has done my fair share of western hunting, western hunting is exciting. And, like, when you see that animal and you decide you're going after it, it's, su- I mean, super exciting. Yep. But it literally, I, like, I'm, I'm serious here, man. Like, it doesn't touch when you're sitting in a tree stand and a buck or even, like, a small buck or sometimes even a doe walks in like 30 yards 40 yards and is just like staring at you the adrenaline dump is yeah. like i've never experienced anything like it yeah it's insane yeah. i believe i believe that man yeah fully yeah so i know it's it's, it's it's the most it's the it's the highest chased it's the highest pursued game animal in the states isn't it white tail deer oh yeah yeah because they're just yeah. they're everywhere man and they're right. fun to hunt they're beautiful uh they're challenged i mean you can you can go on you know you can like even close to my house, um, you know, you can you can strap on a backpack and head into the mountains and 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 do it that way if you want. That there uh, there's less deer density in those areas in the mountains. Um, you know, most of them like to hang out down in the agricultural lands and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I mean they're they're amazing. That's you know that's where I cut my teeth. So um, and actually, you know, I'm kind of a deer guy. Like actually, this year just finished my North American Deer Slam. So is there like a which is you know coos deer, mule deer, Sitka black tail deer, Columbia black tail deer, deer and white tail deer? Um, yeah. Is there like a New Zealand big game slam or anything like that? Oh, uh, there's yeah, there is, but oh, he froze on me. There's just there's just <laughs> oh, there Good. you go. You're back. Yep. Um. Yeah, there's there is, but there's there's no real official slam. Yeah. There's um, you know, just sort of slams that are run by certain outfitters. And that's it's generally revolving around a red stag and a bull tar. And that's those are like the that's like the dream hunt for a lot of people. Yeah. So, and yeah, I think again for people who don't know, like another reason why there's such great opportunity, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is because these are all, you know, 
technically invasive species, so there's pretty much you can have at it, right? Yeah, so so that I should I should mention. So New Zealand started off as, you know, it's gonna be this outdoorsman's paradise and um we had all these introduced species coming in. And obviously when you introduce species into a new area mm-hmm. and they 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 generally excel they normally do really well so all of a sudden we've got we've got a landscape that has only ever had birds and we had yeah some crazy crazy bird species we had um what's called a mower which yeah. is like a it's like an it's about i think there's don't quote me but there could be 12 different different subspecies of mower and um you know the largest ones were the biggest bird um around you know they're bigger than ostriches they're just Whoa. a huge flightless bird Dude, and hold so on one second my kids just got home from school they're knocking on my door hey guys i'm doing a podcast okay i'll be done in a little bit sorry man okay big area than an ostrich I'll, I'll, that's where you were yeah <laughs> so yeah but bigger than an ostrich you know you're talking huge birds walking the landscape and um they were our herbivores they were the ones that were you know they native to our environment so that's what the environment was used to mm-hmm. so um they got they actually got hunted to extinction by the the early moldy and then potentially i think they were gone before the european settlers arrived hmm. um but yeah like i say i'm not an expert on that don't quote me on that yeah uh we had we had a type of eagle called the Haast eagle or great new zealand eagle that was the largest eagle to I think to ever live and it was big enough to eat, you know, to attack and, and kill these mowers. So you're talking to, you're talking about an eagle Good that's Lord. large enough, large enough to come and get me. Kill an you. ostrich. Yeah. That's wild, dude. So, so it was like, with, it was like Jurassic park of giant birds. Birds. Yeah, exactly. So this, this is what the landscape is used to. And then all of a sudden we've got these introduced, you know, ungulates, deer and, and all these other things in the landscape. So, um, it was, it, it worked great from the outdoorsman's point of view, but eventually it started, uh, the landscape started getting hammered and taking a toll from all this new browsing and things like that, that it wasn't used to in the past. And, um, so yeah, fast forward and basically the moral of what I'm trying to tell you is our government sees all these animals, not as an asset anymore, and they see them as a pest and, um, the class they're categorized as a pest, um, which is it's you know it sucks man so what what that means is um you know there's there's certain groups out there that if they had their way they would remove every single introduced species in the country just overnight you know be gone like that if they had I think I lost. Yes. Hold on, guys. The connection's bad. Let's see. Internet connection is unstable. You there? Yeah, I got you now. Is okay. it me, me or you? I think, I think it's, it's probably I'm me. Really... Yeah. It's probably me. Um, So you're talking about how they're... they're um, considered pests which in the short run is cool because it's like yeah you can kill them all but then in the long run it's not cool because they want to get rid of them completely yeah exactly so um i mean the the hunting industry in itself is i think it's a it's a billion dollar industry uh we we worldwide it's known new zealand is still known as a as a bucket list destination for hunting so um we get a huge all right. Sorry, I got so, you back, man. Sorry, it sounds dude. Like it's all good. It sounds like your kids might have jumped on the internet and they're taking <laughs> some of your bandwidth. I was literally just thinking that. They're like down there watching like some dumb Minecraft YouTube videos or something. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah. so, yeah, man, that's so you're saying it was a, it's a huge industry, a billion dollar industry. And then you froze again. Yeah. So we get we get um, a lot of hunters coming over to New Zealand to hunt what we have here. Uh, there's a lot of there's a really good hunting industry here and um plenty of outfitters plenty of guides and you know 
I'd love to know the number of hunters that actually arrive, but it's it's thousands each year come to hunt New Zealand. So yeah, the thing yeah where I, where I was going with this before we lost connection was um the the government in certain parts of certain groups see them as pests, but they also bring a lot of tourism to New Zealand and a lot of money into mm-hmm. the economy. And um, it's a you know it's a valuable asset, man. Like in you look at the bull tar, the Himalayan tar, for example. Um, we've got a, a really stable population and um, basically we're the only place in the world where you can come and hunt them in the mountains like this, just like yeah. you would be back in their homeland of the Himalayas. So, I mean, that should be seen as an asset in my opinion. Yeah, um, for sure. But yeah. Um, I think I was watching like Planet Earth or something the other day and there was like these crazy penguins that like migrate and then like walk all the way into the jungle. Is that New Zealand? Um, there is <laughs> the, yeah, in the South Island there is there is a type of penguin that does that, I believe. I don't know how far in they go though. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that was totally random. Um <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um so I kind of lost my train of thought with all the freezing, man. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to ask no, that's so are good. there any introduced predators? So there are, there are, but they are small predators. So we have three types of mustelid. We've got a weasel, a stoat, and a ferret. Mm. Um, they're, <laughs> you know, they're, they're quite similar to your, what, what would you guys have over there that are similar, like a pine martin? Pine martin, yeah. yeah. I saw one of those um, this year. Apparently they're super rare. Yeah, okay. So we've got, we've got those, and they were, they were brought to New Zealand to control the rabbit numbers. So the rabbits, the rabbits were also brought to New Zealand, and um, and they got out of control. So the stoats, the weasels, the ferrets were brought to New Zealand to control the rabbits. Yeah. But when they once they're here, they realised, oh, actually, all these birds are way easier to get. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, we're, those are our probably our most gnarly predators, and okay. uh, they do some they do some serious damage to the the native birds. But we don't have any large predators apart from wild dogs. Uh, but you know they're they're not super popular, not super common, I suppose, like yeah. you would have in, say, Australia. But, um, yeah, we don't have mountain lions. We don't have right. bears. You know, we don't have anything like that. That, you know, I could go into the wilderness by myself and not have to worry about getting ripped out of my tent by a grizzly bear, you know? So, <laughs> yeah. It's, and it's funny, too, because, like, the grizzly bears in the lower 48 are pretty dangerous. But, like, up in Alaska where they're hunted, they're very polite. <laughs> like right. if they see you yeah, they're gone yeah. um okay but uh that's that's cool man um oh i was gonna say like when just real quick like when's the best is there a best time to come to new zealand or is it like just all the time is something to hunt yep so there's you can hunt all year round um but there's obviously better times than others sure. if you if you want to come and do for example if, if you want to do a if you want to get a goal of getting a red stag you know say like a nice red stag um the best time to do that is obviously the rut and um they're very vocal they're like elk um they're very vocal they're fighting amongst each other you can call Mm -hmm. them in it's incredible hunting so the rut is the best time Um, but then also you can hunt them any any time of the year Um, but then you got to take note that they cast they shed their antlers in our our spring onwards so they, they're regrowing new antlers over the summer period so yeah yeah there's there's definitely times where you wouldn't shoot them i'd never shoot one in velvet um i'd never i'd never um i'd never do it you know so yeah why you're is gonna that? do red stags well i don't know like i like i our freeze is full of wild game um i that's all we eat for meat basically mm, so but I also personally like to have a set of antlers from that trip as well, you know. So yeah. if I can if I can fill the freezer with all this nice organic wild game, but then also have a set of antlers yeah. that's hanging up in my in my shed. For sure. Um that reminds me of that hunt every oh, day. Oh dude, you've got to justify and, having antlers. Look I mean, look behind me. Yeah, um, exactly. So that's that's why. That's yeah. why. So I Well, I I shot a caribou this year in Velvet because by the time they're hard horned, it's pretty cold up there. But um, yep. you can preserve it. Um, I'm getting, I'm still going to oh, get yeah. a euro mount done of that thing, which I'm actually looking forward to. That'd be pretty cool. A freaking velvet euro mount. 
yeah, don't don't get me wrong. That that's good when they're fully developed. Yeah, the velvet is right. is amazing. But I was sort of thinking we were talking about like <laughs> yeah. three weeks or a little month nubs. growth. You know, just like a little nub <laughs> poking out. Yeah, you don't want so, that. When do they? Uh, when's yeah. the roar over there? The roar is it starts in March and it sort of goes through March, April, and then nice. in some areas it can be into May. But generally, the end of March, early April is the peak. And, that's um, music to my ears, man, because that's when you basically can't hunt anything, except for maybe bears over here. Okay. Yeah, so we do <laughs> generally the generally the red deer start rutting first, and then you can almost do like a tour, a deer tour in New Zealand, so when you can yes. just hunt the rutting animals because they're all sort of like one after another nearly, which is pretty cool. And I, I sort of plan to do that one day, just dedicate a season of just yeah. trying to get um, a nice – representative um animal in each species hunting through each species rut that'd be awesome that's that's a pretty cool idea um yeah so most people come to new zealand like all the outfitters they're firing up in february and the peak times march april may and and yeah that's generally when a lot of the hunting visitors sort of come over here um that's amazing. but yeah like you can you can come to like for example you could fly over here and hunt New Zealand yourself without a guide or anything like that. Um, but there's, there's certain things that you probably want to be careful of. Like, um, for you to bring your own rifle over in that situation is near impossible because you is need it? contacts over here for, um, to register it and, and all the stuff It's to do with our firearms laws. You couldn't just pack your rifle, check it in and fly over. It would, they wouldn't let it in. They'd be like, what the heck's going on? So <laughs> that's, that's the, the first hurdle. The second hurdle is that New Zealand is very unforgiving and New Zealand is very hard to hunt if you don't know what you're doing and don't yeah. know where you where you're you know where you're meant to be going or you don't know the animals. You might be the most experienced hunter over there in the in the States. Um, but if you if you've never hunted a fallow deer in, in a wilderness zone or anything like that, you know, good luck trying to find one type thing. So Oh dude. I've had um, a couple of friends that have almost died over there, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, it's <laughs> dangerous, man. New Zealand's a dangerous place because our our mountains aren't huge. Like our mountains, um, I mean, they're 2,000, 2000 odd meters. So what's that in feet? Uh, uh, like six. six yeah. 000. So we're we're not hunting twelve thousand foot, you know, zones. But our mountains, they they basically come out of the down on sea level and mm -hmm. they just go straight up, and yeah. they're incredibly dangerous, incredibly unforgiving and the 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 climate the climate over here is super um yeah it's, it's not it's not a kind place if you're not prepared for it for sure so yeah, a lot of people get get stuck and get themselves into trouble over here and i think through doing what i do and also having a background in guiding in the guiding industry um a lot of people reach out to me and say hey man we want to come and hunt new zealand can you give us a few pointers or can you can you, um, you know, can we do it or what, what, what do we need to do sort of thing? My first, my first sort of, um, port of call there is I always say, go with an outfitter, go with a guide yeah. because you, you might only have a 10 day window where you can get to New Zealand. The first thing is New Zealand's a long way from the States. It is. It's a big flight. It's an expensive flight. And a lot of, a lot of people in the past have flown all the way over here with the goal of getting a red stag, getting a bull tar, getting all these things. And then they've got 10 days or 14 days to do it, but they get here and then it's just, everything's so intimidating. They don't know where to start. Yeah. They don't know where to get their different permits. And, you know, there's all sorts of things that you've got to, you've got to navigate through. So it's, it's always wise to, to go with a guide. Cause then, you know, you're going to guarantee get into the animals that you want, yeah. you want to try and do for sure. Um, and there's there's a there's so many guides and so many outfitters and stuff like that over here offering amazing hunts. I mean, you can hunt, um, you can hunt private land, you can hunt high fence, you know, like high game animal quantity sort of zones. Yeah. You can hunt, you can hunt public land, you can hunt wilderness zones, you can hunt. There's there's a huge variety of what type of hunting um, we have here on offer. Uh, my my YouTube channel, all my films on my YouTube channel are all public land uh public land slash wilderness zones nice. and that's kind of what i like you know i've 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 done a lot of hunting and guiding on private land and stuff like that but 
my own personal hunts i like to get into those sort of super wild remote zones yeah so everything you see on youtube is 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 deep somewhere in some nasty little area yeah that's awesome man yeah. and there's just something special about grabbing a rifle and just walking out on public you don't got to ask anybody's permission you don't got to be careful about this or that you just you just go for it man there's just something like childlike yeah. about that and um you know i almost feel like if i ever go to new zealand like the tar is like almost like you almost have to like hunt tar when you're there just because it's so unique and such a cool opportunity but like personally i think it'd be super cool to do like one of those more like lowland red stag hunts man like that just looks super cool um that's my favorite is it my 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 personal favorite is yeah chasing stags down in the rainforests and the jungles yeah Yeah, and like the river zones like those we touched on it earlier but um the the two episodes i got where i recorded four podcasts that hunt there is my dream hunt that's like if i could is that the one where they hunt. came out on the river and you're like sitting there waiting for them and it's like a little like riverbed yep 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 i watched that one probably that one yeah so there's two parts there's a part one and a part two yeah and i'm i'm looking for i'm i'm looking for a nice animal that gets me excited so so these our public land animals our our wild animals uh not what you see on Instagram, you know, or, or online, you'll see a stag that's got a thousand points. Yeah. You know, and you're like, I, I see that. I'm like instantly like high fence. Boom. Don't care. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that, so those, those type of animals are, um, you know, they're bred and depending on the, on the outfitter, um, they're either, they're like a, a wild bred animal. So they're, they're in an enclosed area, but they're left to their own device. You know, they're populating and they're doing their, their thing in there. Uh, but then other outfitters will actually bring animals in prior to the season and release them into the zone mm. for the hunters to hunt. And I mean, it's amazing hunting. It's exciting hunting and all that stuff. Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong. It, it is, it can offer an amazing hunt, um, but it's different. It's different yeah. to the wild animals, you know, it's different to the public yep. land animals, but a lot of guys come to New Zealand and they want to have a great hunt and they want to have an exciting hunt, see a lot of animals, get a lot of opportunities and then get a really nice animal to take home maybe that's the hunting for them because if you were to do like if we talk about that particular wilderness river hunt that we just spoke about in the jungle um you could do two to three weeks in there and you could not see a single animal you know Mm. that's that's the sort of that's the sort of difference you might go to a private land or a high fence block or something and have the hunt of your life with all these animals or you can go into a unfenced wilderness remote public land zone and not see a single animal and fly home empty-handed so mm-hmm. that's the difference so a lot of people do come to new zealand and they want to guarantee an animal or guarantee a great hunt they'll go with a guide go with an outfitter P- private land is mostly what they do sure um but yeah the public land stuff's incredible but it is incredibly difficult as well yeah absolutely that's and yeah, it's the like that difference, here too. i should i'll just mention quickly so the difference on animals like that particular stag that i end up shooting on that episode you know the two-part episode mm-hmm. that particular stag is a monster for a public land stag here that's a yeah he that's was a nice. real good one it's one of the one of the better ones i've ever seen um and you know that that gets me really excited but if you put that next to a, a private land stag or a high fence stag um you know it's going to look small but yeah the difference is that you can't even compare them you can't even compare them oh, because yeah. they're, 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 they're separated but a lot of people don't understand that um those differences are even a real thing if that makes sense you know oh, 100%. they just see a stag and they think oh that one's a big one. Oh, that one's a small one but yeah. they don't know where it's come from they don't know the history of it so no i, yeah, I totally get thing. you man i totally get yeah. you like same thing here man um you can go to these places that are like trophy whitetail ranches where they're literally like selectively bred to be like these freaks and like yeah. I'm not knocking guys. They want to do that. I'm sure it's fun, whatever. It's not for me. And like, I don't, I would rather kill like a nice little, like one of these bucks back here on public land, like a wild animal than pay a trophy fee to go get some like farm raised deer. Anyway, I'm not trying to knock people. It's just, but yeah, I totally get that man. Like the trophy, that trophy you got to me, same way as a hundred times. It's yeah. just not even, like I said, it's not, you can't even compare it. It's like a yeah. canned thing versus like the real thing. But anyway, yeah. man, um, that's there's, awesome. There's and you can bring, 
I was going to say, you can bring yeah, meat like, home to the U.S. from New Zealand, correct? Yeah, the, you can do it. There's a lot of paperwork and a lot of hoops you got to jump through to do that, um, but it is it's it can be done. Yeah. Okay. So cool. I don't know, like uh, we in the past we'd have a, we'd have clients that would want to take their meat home, and um, yeah, it's possible. It can be done. <laughs> I don't know the exact steps that need to be taken. Yeah. But it's possible. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Cool, man. Well, um, yeah, I feel like I could talk to you for hours, dude, but I want to uh, respect your time and, um, and everything. So, um, you know, anything else you want to say just in closing or anything like that? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm the same. Like, I, I feel like we're only just getting started, man. To be I know. Honest. Well, we can do another one, man. Um, for sure. But, uh, all right. Well, you got a good hunting story for me? Yeah, oh uh, yeah, yeah. There's a few. I think I'll talk about because you know Pedro. Well, oh yeah, yeah. oh because, yeah. Tell me about hunting with Pedro. Yeah, so it's it, it's funny. We were chatting about his, you know his name, the pronouncing pronunciation of his name, and he's like, yeah, all my American friends they call me Pedro or this and that. <laughs> Pedro. And, um, it's just it's all different parts of the world like pronounce his name differently so yeah, yeah it's just it's a funny <laughs> discussion we had but but yeah me and pedro are, we're very similar sort of people and um we had a great hunt together um it was a 14 day hunt i think it was and we sort of had no set goals on what we wanted but it was going to be a wilderness a wilderness based hunt yeah. and um we were just going to take opportunities that you know that that presented themselves we had a prototype rifle from Bagara, the first of its kind. Yeah. So we were, you know, we were using some some um, some gear that we were testing as well. Um, and yeah, it was it was a it was a challenging hunt. The first place we went to, so most of the wilderness stuff that we do over here, you can only access it by helicopter. Um, right. So a lot of it, you know, it's just it's like Alaska and Canada where you'll take. You'll take a, a plane in. You'll mm -hmm. take a super cub in, uh, but we don't use super cubs here because our mountains are too steep. You know, we don't yeah. have a, a lot of the zones. We don't have those big open long ridges and stuff. So a lot of our our hunts are accessed by helicopter. So we'll we'll fly in, we'll land, we'll unload the gear, we'll set up camp. You know, the helicopter's flying back to its base, and 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 in ten days time or fourteen days time or whatever, that helicopter will come and pick you up. Right. So so we did this is what we did we did that hunt we went to a zone that i've been eyeing up for years i've been wanting to go there for years and it's it's super remote it's it's amazing looking area i've i've flown over it before i've looked into it from like the distant areas around it and i've always thought one day i want to go in there because that's like it's it's pretty wild in there and i feel like it could be could offer a really great hunt for us so we started off in there and um unfortunately fast forwarding it was tough hunting the, yeah. the game numbers were really low in there um we had it was the peak of the the hunting season in new zealand so we had there was a lot of outfitters in full swing yeah. and um and and one of the tactics to hunting over here in in the outfitter world is to do a heli hunt which is fly around in the helicopter spot animals land get out shoot it get back in the helicopter and fly back to the base with your animal. So Jeez. that's, um, that's a, it's a pretty common thing over here. Yeah. And I've been on both sides. I've been in the helicopter doing that. And I've also been on foot while that's happening around you. And, yeah. you know, it's, I guess moral of the story on that is, is some people might come to New Zealand and have a lifelong goal of getting a bull tar, but there's no way they're ever going to climb the mountains they need to climb to get that animal. Yeah. So it's a way that people can access those animals. Yeah. So I can, I can see there's there's a potential, you know, there's a potential need for it in some situations, but from from mine and Pedro's point of view, at our remote wilderness camp, having helicopters <laughs> flying around, yeah, you know, stirring up the the limited animals that we've got in our yeah. in our vicinity, it made for tough going. So, we ended up pulling pin on the first location and we relocated to another location, and um, yeah, we got into we got into some tar, and um, pedro got a bull so the first one that we took was a nice bull and it yeah. was a 14 year old bull so about as old as they get pedro will never get a bull like that ever again in his life it was an incredible bull um so that was the, that kicked off our hunt and then um 
and then and then yeah i i think it was a few days later i, I ended up tagging out and getting a bull as well and it was nice. a, another really really good bull so that that hunt there man like that that was yeah. a cool hunt but it was a challenging one just due to we, we had a lot of things going against us in yeah, our man. time frame i watched those um, videos that was that was super cool man that looked like a really fun time yeah yeah and and i think pedro and i will probably get back together and do another collaboration i think yeah going ahead for my future i'm 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 open to doing collab collabs with other youtubers because it's you know it's it's cool man we've got different audiences and if we can bring them together absolutely um, that's more content for people to watch so yeah pedro and i'll probably do a hunt somewhere um i'll most likely go somewhere overseas and we'll, we'll team up and do a hunt there yeah uh, but yeah a lot of people requested that we do some more hunting because yeah it was apparently it was a great watch you know the banter between us was good so <laughs> yeah, yeah he looks cool man um he invited me to go to spain um trying to see if we can work it out this summer um not it's not like nailed down yet but i'm trying to hopefully make that work but um but yeah man that was a cool video series and uh yeah it's fun you can collaborate with people like that so um but yeah dude um you know if people haven't seen your stuff where can they find uh your work to go check it out so mainly two places uh youtube is obviously the first place where they can find me and if they just search j e wilds they'll find me yep. and i've got two channels i've got the fishing channel i've got the hunting channel and um on the hunting channel i generally put out 10 hunts a year mm. and on the fishing channel i put out as many as i can get so nice. yeah every year there, there's generally 10 new hunts going out and um and then also they can track me down on Instagram at j.e.wilds. Cool. And they'll find me on there as well. So, yeah, and also they can link up to the podcast through there on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, just the same thing, J.E. Wilds. Yeah. Um, you'll find me, so, yeah. Awesome, dude. Well, it was great talking to you, man. I appreciate you taking the time. And, uh, yeah, guys, go check out his stuff. It's uh, it was really cool content and uh, solid dude. So thanks again, man. I appreciate you. No worries. Thanks for having me. Hopefully yeah, we get to do a hunt next year, right? Eh? Hey, like I said, don't don't tempt me with a good time, dude. I'll take you up on it. <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll we'll talk about it behind the scenes, but sounds maybe good, we'll man. Try to make something work. Yeah. All right, dude. Well, thanks again for your time, man. Cool. Catch you later, right? Thanks.